According to new research from LifeWay, six in 10 Protestant churches in America are plateaued or declining in attendance. Said differently, most churches are small and struggling. So what can we do about this? Well, in this video, we'll aim to answer that question and point your church toward a series of steps you can take to reverse this downward trend. Well, hey there, and welcome to Pro Church Tools, the show where in 10 minutes or less, you're going to get a dose of tips and tactics to help your church share the message of Jesus while we navigate the biggest communication shift in the last 500 years. I'm your host, Alex Mills, joined as always by the boss man, Brady Shearer. Alex, a new study from Exponential by Lifeway found six in 10 Protestant churches in America are plateaued or declining in attendance, mm. and more than half saw fewer than 10 people become new Christians in the past 12 months. The way that the research describes it, most churches are small and struggling. Yeah. So what can we what can we do about this? Well, first of all, and, and this is coming from a pastor of a church of about 100 people, and so I know what this is like. But first of all, don't aim to be some sort of discount version of a megachurch, right? Don't look down the street and see the church of 200 people, and then look a little further down the street and see the church of 2,000 people and measure your success or your church's health off of their size or what they're capable to do, of their budget, of what their pastor gets paid, right? You have to be okay with just being who you are, to quote uh, the great Aubrey Graham, uh, know yourself and know your worth. And that's true. Facts. That's true, right? Like for a church of 100 people like mine, our, our church and our people who make up our church are not inherently worth any less than the church of a thousand down the street, right? We are serving our community the way we know how, and and what we're doing is good work. Well, and I think from a strategic standpoint, it's easy for smaller churches to look up to bigger churches mm -hmm. and say, okay, they are succeeding, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. We must model their efforts so that we will become like them. Exactly. But you can't do what they're doing. No. And they can't do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It works in the inverse as well, because I serve at a big church and you serve at a small church. And in our meetings, we often talk about, oh, if only we were smaller, we could pivot faster. Exactly. We could move easier. Everyone's looking down the street. Grass is always greener. Water the grass on your side of the fence. Yeah. Yeah. Next, you have to recalibrate the way you measure church growth. And we think that you should be measuring church growth. But the problem is most churches get caught measuring their church growth exclusively by attendance, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why we've put out this free resource and it'll be in the show notes below, the new church growth calculator. It Sure, attendance is one of the things we look at, but it's amongst 16 other areas of your church that you get to look at and say, how are the people, how are the 100 people who call Life Abundant Niagara home, how are they growing, right? How do they look more like Jesus today than they did on this day last year? And so we have to reevaluate what we're what we think is healthy, what we're looking for in a healthy church, and how we're calculating that growth towards health and towards, you know, a vibrant church that's full of vitality, regardless of what size we are and how many people call that church home. Yeah, because attendance and overall weekly numbers can be deceiving. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for them not to tell the full story. One of the questions that was asked in this uh, research was, Okay, church, in the past 12 months, how many people have indicated a new commitment to Jesus Christ as Savior through your church? And on the surface, that seems like a great question to yeah. ask to identify, is your church growing or is it not? Of course, how do you quantify someone actually making a commitment to Jesus? It's a raised hand in the back row. Right well, that's there. what's interesting. <laughs> the research found that the majority of Pentecostal pastors, and this study was asking the senior pastor mm -hmm. in each church, 57% of Pentecostal pastors say they saw 10 or more new commitments to Christ in their church last year per 100 attendees. So it's scaled based mm -hmm. on size to be proportionate for all churches. The next closest denominations were Lutherans at 39%, Holiness at 80, uh, 38%, Baptists at 35%. Now, growing up in a Pentecostal church, like we both did, getting our degree at a Pentecostal Bible college, mm -hmm. currently serving in Pentecostal <laughs> churches, I think we are qualified to yeah. say that that number may be inflated just a wee <laughs> bit yeah. because most charismatic Pentecostal churches are judging new commitments by, I see that hand. Yeah. I see Thank that you. hand. Thank you for that. And we should all know that those may or may not actually be, be, be determining factors of a new commitment to Christ. Right. It could just be a, a real emotional decision that doesn't actually lead to true discipleship. Right. I mean, what is it worth if that person who's raising their hand 
in in January of this year and in December, you know, they're they're not not only with your church anymore, but they're not only they're, they're not with any church. They're they're two steps back from where they were in January when they raised their hand, right? It's this holistic way of evaluating how people are progressing in their life with Jesus that we have to determine how is our church and how are the people who make up our church doing. And the more empirical those next steps can be, like instead of raised hands, sure. we say use baptisms. Yes. There's no way of fabricating. No, they definitely went under the water. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was real. And it took a lot for them mm -hmm. to do that. It wasn't just a raised hand in an emotional moment when nobody was looking. And after they got baptized, now they're part of a small group. And now they're serving in the Sunday service. You get to see that yes. progression. And that's a much better way of actually determining. Because mm -hmm. if you just have all those raised hands, you can fool yourself into thinking you're growing and you might actually not be. Yep. Number three, evaluate honestly and set your trajectory. We talked about evaluating honestly, are people actually making commitments, mm -hmm. but also when it comes to your goals as a church. I spent a ton of time and continue to spend time in the charismatic world, and this is a little bit different than Pentecostal in Canada, but the extreme charismatic world where some of my family is from and where I spent a ton of time in college, we would go to these revival services, these really small churches, mm -hmm. and we'd spend like, endless hours seeking God, like praying, set our city ablaze. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help being the, you know, rational thinker, one sure. on the Enneagram sociopath that yeah. I am, <laughs> standing in the back or often on the drum kit, yeah. thinking to myself like, like, what about our existing congregation? Like, right. are, are they becoming more like Jesus? Mm -hmm. Or what about the neighborhood that's adjacent to our meeting yeah. location? Are they being po positively affected yeah. by this church? Because we're always thinking like, change our country. It's like, well, does anyone even know we meet yeah, in this location? Yeah, what about your neighbors? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and why are we always scoffing at incremental growth? Like if this church grew by 10% based on actual empirical metrics that we could track, would that not be worth ce celebrating? Or does yeah. it only count if the country of Canada becomes 95% Pentecostal? <laughs> uh, and then what about the infrastructure? If that happened? You'd be in big trouble. Where like we our, put church all these of, our church of 72 people that like rents this basement location yeah. that's already full, like what happened if a thousand were added to our numbers Yeah, exactly. Next week. How are you going to check all those kids in? We're having 75 <laughs> services next weekend, and our pastor will be preaching on all of them, and never again, because yeah. he will be with the no, Lord. Knowing Pentecostals, they would just do a 48-hour like prayer and worship session. Be like, church is going on for 48 hours straight, so see you there. <laughs> so, Drop in whenever you want. <laughs> so true. Final thing is to prioritize community. Young adults that have an older mentor in church are considerably more likely to not drop mm -hmm. out of church once they head into, into college and, and beyond. I found my first real group of friends at youth group. Mm -hmm. I never felt like I fed, uh, really fit in with the, with the jocks and the sports crew because I was too smart and I, uh, academically, and I never felt like I fit in with the academics because I love sports so mm -hmm. much. I went to church, and I, I feel like in high school, such a turbulent time. Yeah. It was my first place where I was accepted and loved for the crazy, neurotic freak of nature in high school yeah. that, that I was. And that's what makes church so powerful. Mm -hmm. And there have been times in the last 10 years where I have so seriously doubted the role of church and theology and what I believe or what I don't believe. But that friend group is still here to this mm -hmm. day. I went on a mission trip with Jonas, who's behind the camera right now. And our, both of our faiths have changed considerably in the last 10 years, but we're still here together. Yeah. And we were having communion last week. And I was saying, guys, there have been so many times where I've lost faith in, you know, so something I think in the Bible, or I've lost faith in a church leader that I once mm -hmm. looked up to and then had a serious moral failure. But when I look in the face of all of you who have been here for so long and we're so imperfect, all of us, I see the face of Jesus. Yeah. You know, you guys are being the Christian faith that I need. Like, you know, you're sustaining me when yeah. other things are not. That's what community does. Yes. That's what the body of Christ is meant to do. Mm -hmm. And for better or for worse, a lot of our churches are becoming like theaters, shows. We go in and we go out. But if you can prioritize community and create the type of community that I just described that I have in my mm -hmm. own life, if we can recreate that and rebirth that all around the world, people that are going to struggle with their faith for whatever reason are going to stay with it because they have the right people in their lives that are like, we're with you no matter what. That's what doing life together, quote unquote, right. should actually be. Yeah, and for those people who do raise their hand in the Sunday morning service. And, you know, when the pastor says, everyone bow your head and close your eyes and raise your hand if you agree with this prayer. Those people who do raise their hands, that's how, that should be their next step, right? Knowing that this environment that they're in and these people that they were surrounded with when they raised their hands and, and made that, that choice, their next step is to get integrated fully into that community. And that's the life, that's the church. That's what being a, uh, an arm and a leg, you know, like Paul talks about, that's, that's what this is all about. 
And like you said, when you have those questions, when you have those times, when you have those doubts, those people aren't going anywhere. And that's what being fully integrated in church looks like. That's how it's supposed to work. It's all based around community, communal living. Uh, that's, that's what it is. There's no easy answers, and we that's can't true. solve this in <laughs> 10 minutes or less, yeah. which is why we went over. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, though, taking these steps can lead to a more vibrant, life-giving, and growing church in the ways that actually matter most. That'll do it for this episode of Pro Church Tools. We'll see you next time. Subscribe! <laughs>